Hey guys, welcome to Repair University Live. We've got a great show for you today. Mark is back uh, from Vico Experts. He joined us last uh, week, or last month, last, last week, month, right? Yep. <laughs> last, <laughs> last month on the Scanning and Diagnostic Show. Larry, you're back from the cruise. Yes. Welcome back. You look a little tan. <laughs> a little bit. Did you have a good time? <laughs> and relaxed. Yeah. And yeah. relaxed. Yeah. Uh, all right. So today we're going to be covering aluminum repair. We're going to go kind of quickly through a lot of the um, a lot of the steps. We want to get you right into the repair process. Um, fair warning: I can't quite um, afford air conditioning in my <laughs> shop. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna sweat today. So we don't are be surprised. We're in the Collision Hub sauna in Benton, Arkansas. Yes. Well, you know, some people have gym <laughs> memberships for their employees. I have a sauna. I yes. just heard them all in the garage. Yes. So. We use lava rocks so we can pull water on them. <laughs> they get a little You're hot. You're welcome. I mean, this is a hot. This is a hot topic and a hot show. Yep. Ah, exactly. Uh, that's a nice lead-in. So uh, terrific. Well, let's get started, guys. We got a lot to do and to do yep. it in an hour, so we can get everybody back to work and what they're uh, what they've got for their day. So. Before we get into repair, <coughs> which is the main purpose, I guess, of what we want to cover today, let's talk a little bit about background and, and kind of get up to speed before we start pulling triggers. Um, aluminum usage, why is it becoming such a big deal? Where is it at? What are we going to find with it? Well, it's lightweight. Yeah. And if we can reduce the uh, weight of the car, obviously we get better gas mileage. Cafe standards are driving it. Materials are driving it. You know, repair costs. I mean, all those different things are just, you know, we're going to see more aluminum. All right. Where are we seeing it in the cars today? Well, pretty much anywhere. Frame rails, outer body panels, you know, anything they can make out of aluminum to make lighter, they're on a, a bent to make it that way, engine blocks, etc. So we're gonna see it increasingly throughout the car. Again, frame rails, seats, everything. I think you'll see a move away from mild steel, uh, even on outer panels, and you're gonna see more increase of high strength steels for, for dent resistance, low grade high strength steels. You're gonna see more aluminum usage on uh, multiple uh, um, portions of the vehicle, much like we've seen um, for the last 30 years on the German cars. This is why it's a shock to the American culture that you know uh, we haven't seen aluminum a lot on a lot of these cars except maybe hoods. And now you're starting to see a lot of outer panels becoming aluminum on you know, everyday supposed cars in rural areas of the country. Metropolitan cities have seen aluminum panels on cars for many, many years. And obviously the German certified or European certified collision repair shops have been seeing this for the last 25, 30 years on the outer panel. So they're really, you know, in tune with it. Problem is the masses weren't ready for a, a, a popular <coughs> vehicle to come out that has aluminum. And there's a lot of confusion, a lot of myth information, and a lot of misinformation. And uh, unfortunately, we're trying to prevent trial and error like we had in the 80s when they went yeah. to you know, more unitized structures. Right. And, and, it's not, and it's not completely new. I mean, like the Ford Rangers had aluminum hoods since the 90s. So this is not like a new thing. It's just they're using a lot more of it. Right, so we're seeing more of it now. Yeah. And some of that misconceptions come from uh, a little bit of sales in the marketplace, selling yep. tools and, and pushing some of that. Sales, some of that, ignorance, yeah. lack of um, lack of training, um, uh, 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 being told by somebody else that you know probably did it the wrong way, and it's not going to be a longevity repair. He just made it look good for now. So yeah. those are some of the issues that get pulled into this. So we talked a little bit about uh, where we're going to see it, which is basically everywhere, from structure to exterior panels yeah. to to cast towers to whatever. Um, what are the types of, is aluminum aluminum? Is it just, or is there different grades like there is with steel? No, you, you, you have seven series of aluminum. One being the lightest, thinnest, most uh, uh, ductile, all the way up to 7,000 series, which is the strongest. Most suspension parts and bumper reinforcements are either six or 7,000 series aluminum. Um, there's different alloying agents that go into these that give it different, uh, uh, different characteristics. And you'll have, obviously, stampings on the outside and you'll have extrusions which is basically uh, hydroformed uh, 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 panels you take a round tube you hydroform it into a box like shape or a rectangular shape and you can curve it and shape it in different uh, uh, formats to make it a, let's say a unirail it's gonna, much it's like steel like when we were kids we used to take play-doh and put it into a thing and right. push the button and it came out as a shape that's an extrusion that's an, yeah basically yeah. that's what it is and that's the same between steel and aluminum that, yeah. that you have steel extrusions, you have you know flat stock steel, and you have aluminum that can be extrusions and flat uh, uh, stock. Well, now we also add in with aluminum, you add in cast, and there's multiple different types of cast that you're going to see throughout the car. Usually suspension mounting areas, 
front strut towers, rear strut towers. You'll see it sometimes uh, as bumper brackets welded onto an extrusion. So it, it takes on a, a um, it's a completely different animal when you're actually analyzing the damage, and it's completely different when you have to repair it. Um, the outer panels give you the most, or the sheet aluminum gives you the most opportunity for repair. You cannot repair cast and you cannot repair uh, extrusions usually. They usually have to be changed in their entirety. Uh, cast can't be welded unless it's new because a break or a fracture in it causes micro cracking and, and small gaps in the area. By welding that, even though it looks good, uh, you're causing a little tiny explosions and more cracking in the area. A flat new, brand new edge piece uh, that you get can be welded usually uh, from some manufacturers. Some manufacturers have only riveting. So it all depends on what you have. But today we're just going to concentrate on the outer cosmetic panels. Yeah, so if you look at the aluminum usage slide that is up there, basically anything that's green is a potential for repair. But if it's red or blue, it's probably not repairable. Right. We're going to be taking that, taking that out and putting something new there, right? Yep. Yes. Um, so let's talk about the repairability of aluminum. Okay. Um, you know, it's a... I wanna, let's, let's just talk about a myth there, Larry. Is, is fixing aluminum the same as fixing steel? No. Um, you know, I see technicians, owners, insurance adjusters, uh, uh, salesmen all come up with the same asinine type thing. Oh, it's the same thing. Listen, because the equipment is similar looking, doesn't mean it gets done the same way. It's, it's almost as ignorant as uh, me saying or teaching a class on, here's a plastic uh, nitrogen welder, and here's plastic repair material for a bumper cover. And here's steel repair equipment, and here's steel welders. Uh, resistance welders and, and mag welders. And if I tell you the same exact thing, you probably wouldn't tune into the show and probably not talk to me. That's how ignorant it is that I see it when I look at it, when I hear somebody say, oh, it's repairing the same thing. It's not, it's a different technique, it's a different process. Just like silicone bronze uh, or, or MIG brazing is different than steel or aluminum brazing. It, the problem is it's similar looking equipment. It's similar looking techniques, but they couldn't be as far on the opposite yin and yang as you could possibly get. They're opposite sides of the spectrum. So what are some yeah. things when we're talking about, you know, the repairability or the characteristics of aluminum? Yeah. What are, well, what are some things you know, that make One different? of the biggest things about aluminum is it's not, when it dents, it's not the same. So if I were to take this steel fender, and the easiest way to explain why this is steel, we've got the tape thing on here, it's got a magnet, we've got a magnet here, but it doesn't stick to this at all. So you can see that, obviously, aluminum. So we've got a very, very different um, substrate. So if I take a hammer, and I'm gonna make a dent in this, and I just make a dent, that's how big the dent is. Now, if I take the same hammer and I go to an aluminum hood, and I just make a dent, that dent is much smaller for the same hammer hit. Now, the other problem is, is how big that dent actually is. So if I were to actually show how it went, wrong pen, if I were to actually show how big this is, this little dent that doesn't look very big actually goes all the way out to here, which we'll be talking about how to remove that dent a little later. So just because you have a dent that you're used to estimating or fixing that's steel, aluminum is going to be a very different conversation, which of course Larry's going to be going through extensively a little bit later. So now, guys, the, now you want to talk about the other repair stuff too? Uh, well, what are some of the characteristics? I know we've talked about elasticity, no memory. Yeah. I mean, what are some of the specific characteristics of aluminum that affect its repairability? It has no memory. As you know, Mark showed there, um, it takes a hit differently. It is very dent resistant. Mm -hmm. That's why you see a lot of door skins or even door assemblies being used as aluminum. It's very dent resistant. Um, you'll see fenders being used that way or even hoods. They're very dent resistant. And some of the PDR guys out there know trying to remove some of the dents on the hoods can be a little bit tricky. You gotta use some heat techniques or heat lamps or even probably do it out in the sun uh, to get that panel a little bit warmer to try and coax it into moving. It's, um, it doesn't remember where it was. Steel, on the other hand, has some sort of memory. Uh, with the aluminum, you also have micro cracking that can uh, uh, be an issue. Um, ripping and tearing is very popular for it. And even though you think you can repair it, it's not gonna last because by heating it through the welding process, you're, you're causing cracks around the outside area on a panel that's already been fractured. You know, welding brand new clean has no stress of fracture. Most of these outer panels are approximately 0.9 millimeter. So you now rip or tear it, it probably gets down to 0 0.6, 0 0.7 millimeter in the area in which it's torn. Now you weld that area and try and fill the void 
and you cause now heat cracking and thinning and work hardening of the metal in the area. So this is where this now becomes a problem. I, I guess, better, lack of better terminology, if you got a crack or a rip or a tear on the edge or a fracture on the edge of a fender, probably not the best thing to fix because it's probably going to break again, especially because it might be near a bolted area or a bracket area. Right. Now you guys brought an example of that, right? Yeah. Yes, so, we do. So if we look at this fender here, <clears throat> So this fender has a number of different areas, and it was really great because we posted some of these yesterday on some of the collision repair groups, and we were asking repair or replace, and you know, some said, oh, repair all day long. Some said, I'm not repairing that. Some said uh, that, well, we need more information. Well, that's actually the right answer. So one of the things about aluminum, as, as we explained, is the brick, it looks like it's bigger than what it actually is. It also, we need to be concerned about what it is. So if we look at this dent here, that doesn't look that bad. Now, if we look at this dent here, that also doesn't look that bad. But this dent here is much bigger than this dent. Now, one of the big things to look at is the back side. So Larry's going to be demonstrating later that we're going to be using heat in a lot of these repairs to get it to relax and pull back out because aluminum has no memory. If we look at this dent that's here, the back side has a attaching bracket here. So if we were to heat this up, we could, well, first of all, we're going to melt or possibly even catch on fire this area in here. So this dent here is repairable, and this dent here is not repairable because of this. The other dent that we have is right here, and as Larry just said, the, I mean, the dent itself is not bad, but let's look at the edge. The edge is actually cracked and torn, so what would it take to actually fix that crack, Larry? Well, you gotta obviously ground down the area there, you have to dress it, you have to uh, do a little V-groove, then you're gonna have to weld it, yep. which is gonna cause all kinds of issues. And because of the way that flange is, you only have access to one side of it, yep. not the back side to finish and clean it and try and get it in the right way. So you, you have a lot of aspects there that, I mean, once again, we're just gonna say it's from here back, right. not That's that not damage yeah. there. But uh, I mean, you're gonna have an issue with it and it's not, uh, uh, like I said, aluminum doesn't like to move. Yeah. And because of the, the work hardening you're gonna put into it to move it, it becomes a bigger issue. Yeah. Uh, some of the other things that you and I talked about, we had this fender here, and, and I mean, this looks like a very repairable fender. It's yeah. fairly easy. Yeah. Um, it looks like- right in here, you know, a little tougher there, but that's right. pretty repairable, And uh, right? you, know, you got some gra gouging a little bit here, yeah. but not enough to say the panel's too thin. Right. Well, when we take a look at the back side of it and the front edge, you can see that the front edge of it's got, you know, these rivet looking the things clinches, yeah. or something there. And they're actually called clinches. It's actually two pieces of metal squeezed together with a die. And you look at the back side and we have this big, huge, massive bracket that happens to be in this area. And because this bracket's in that area, I don't have access to the back side of the panel. Right. But what's worse is, is that this, this uh, uh, area, the way it's connected and it's rolled, is gonna be very hard to try and fix or yeah. get it right. And now, this clinch right here. Actually, it's right my way. Yeah, so it's <laughs> separated here. So how would we fix that clinch then? Uh, you can't, you oh. don't fix clinches. Right. right. You know, it's like saying, well, I got a hood that's clinched on. I'm gonna separate the outer panel from the inner panel and <laughs> fix it and put it back together. Or get a used outer hood panel. Well, I've been doing <laughs> this for 40 years. I can I've been, do that, yeah. yeah. No, 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 you can drill it out and you go to Home Depot or Lowe's and you buy some rivets <laughs> and you just rivet it back together. Because I mean, listen, you could abortionize anything you want back together. And you know, someone's always gonna try and figure a way of doing yeah. something different because you know a real body man's gonna alter it because people have educations and have diplomas on the walls that their engineers don't know anything and um, you know I know better because I can figure it out so we're gonna yeah. go back to the chrome magnet area uh, era <laughs> where we learned how to fix fire because we can do that the, the time of fixing things by trial and error are over yeah. there's plenty of studies and educated people have come up with ways to make your job easier why make it harder? Why have the issue with it? And um, you know, this is just an outer cosmetic panel. Yep. Um, no one's gonna die from it, but the fact is, what's the longevity of it? What's gonna happen to it uh, as it runs down the road? Remember, uh, an air, uh, Hawaiian Airlines had a, a stewardess die and people get injured because some mechanic, airline mechanic, decided the two rivets were missing and he wanted to put in two other rivets, but the holes were bigger, so he made bigger holes in there. And it blew open in 1972 or 73, yep. and someone got killed because this guy thought he knew better. He's been doing it for years. Didn't take into consideration the thermal expansion and contraction yep. of the plane as it goes up in the air, yep. from hot to cold, back down to hot again. Yeah, so the this Alaska is what we're doing. had the same thing, where a baggage handler <clears throat> rolled up the ramp to put the baggage into the airplane, and it just touched the side of the airplane. Didn't think much of it, same kind of idea. Right, Scotty. And then, the, and then it landed, you know, it, it flew for a couple times, and then later on, 
the whole side of the plane blew off, nobody died, but it just happened to fracture the aluminum enough to actually cause a problem. Right. So bottom line to this is this fender is not repairable because of that clinch. And we have a, a, what looks like a ding back over here in this area. Yeah. And once again, that would be repairable. It's probably a pretty yeah. fast, quick repair on this one in this back area. So unfortunately, this part of the fender is not repairable, but this part is. Yeah. And even if it was a larger dent, let's say we had a bigger, huger area here, yep. and uh, uh, even if it affected a little bit of the crease line, you got to watch the crease lines or feature lines because they're thinner in those areas. Yep. And a lot of times, a lot of the Europeans have uh, um, restrictions against repairing feature lines. Right. You know, damage to go through feature lines. So it's something to think so, about by looking at the repair manual. So guys, if I'm if I'm maybe looking at a photo of damage on an aluminum panel, um, or I'm I'm doing a a walk-by, drive-through inspection of an aluminum panel without kind of tearing down and looking at that panel, can I make a repair or replace decision based on just an external view? Well, that was kind of our beta test yesterday. When yeah. we were preparing for this, we threw them out there on the internet and said repair or replace. Yeah. And of course, many people said repair, some said replace, but they, we didn't show them all, that, all of it. Right, we so didn't like, give enough information. So Actually, like, two like guys came up right with the right answers. Yeah. By a picture, completely repairable. <laughs> Until you look at the backside, and now it's not. Right. So, a picture, you know, spe speaks a thousand words, but you need ten thousand. You need right. to actually see all, you know, right. a lot more pictures than one or two. And that's why we're teardown and in blueprinting. Yep. Um, but let's talk about. We've mentioned a couple times about heat. Yep. How if I'm going to be fixing aluminum, there's going to be some heat applied. Yep. That's probably not part of a normal steel dent repair process. Yep. Um, let's talk about heat and the effects of heat on aluminum. Well, you'll need obviously some sort of heat. A heat lamp. Uh, uh, um, infrared, a uh, heat gun, um, heat gun yeah. a uh, induction heater works well. And in some cases, if you have full access to the backside, you can get into actually metal shaping and forming, which would be actually using a, uh, uh, a map gas. You don't want to use propane. Propane will add moisture to the expanded aluminum molecules, so it'll actually get trapped in there and cause a problem later on. Uh, you never, never, ever, ever want to anneal aluminum. If I have a flat stock piece and I want to make a motorcycle tank, I'm going to anneal it because I'm going to start with probably a quarter inch thick piece of aluminum, mm -hmm. heat it up so it kind of is flexible and ductile. Now I'm going to work it through plenishing hammers, uh, 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 an English wheel, sometimes just banging on top of a table with a pad on behind it and getting my shape. As I shape it and thin it, it becomes harder or work hardened. So this is what guys have to realize, you never anneal aluminum. Aluminum has uh, uh, a different characteristics and, and uh, your heat treatable and non-heat treatable alloys have different annealing temperatures. So <clears throat> ICAR basically says, like a, the Aluminum Association, 400 to 570 is your repair area. As we saw yesterday, and we'll show an example later on, this aluminum starts moving at about 150, 175 degrees. We started burning paint at like 210, 215 degrees, the paint started to burn. So there's, it's important to understand your, your working areas. Also, we quick cooled a few spots. We actually got the paint to crack, which, <coughs> excuse me, if the paint cracks, well then guess what? I probably caused micro cracking of the aluminum. That's why you don't want to quick cool. You got to let it cool down itself. That can add time to your repair process because literally you got to sit there and wait for it to cool down. You really can't do anything else in between. It's a slower process in some cases, even though the physical labor of it is maybe not as long as steel or could be longer than steel. It all depends. You've got to make an attempt first to add it. Right. Just a lot of different things in play. Now let's talk about that heat. Well, um, let's it, just demonstrate. Yeah. 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 Let's I think that might be the best way. Uh, we burned something yesterday, but let's, um, let's swap this out, get this well, safe. So and this, is, this is one of the things we put on the internet yesterday. We basically asked repair or replace just to joke around. And clearly, we would never repair that. We got all kinds of uh, beer can conversations of, well, we can fix that with aluminum beer cans. and. All that, but suffice it to say, that's not repairable. But <clears throat> as we were just preparing for this, um, what we did was we just ground it off and started heating it up. So Larry's going to uh, show us show us this. And as we do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a temperature monitor that we can show how hot it's getting. And if you see, you can see it moved out a lot, the panel. But let's, let's kind of go through it now. Let's see what we get going on. Now, because of the alloying agents in here, I'm probably, and the fact of the map gas, I'm probably going to get a little discoloration. So now I'm at about 200 degrees. See the paint going? And look at how high this is getting. Now I'm at 350. It's starting to glow. It's starting to glow. 
See that? Now, General Motors, back in the steel days, wow. General Motors, back in the steel days, said 1,000 degrees, kind of a glowing red, is how you repair a frame. Well, right now, we're at 430 degrees, 440 degrees. You can see it's changing, and all of a sudden, as Larry says, it'll just wave at you really quick, and it'll fall apart. Now we're at 502 degrees. And this is a heat treatable alloy, this panel. And you can see here the uh, annealing temperature for heat treatable is 755. I got nowhere near that, and this panel's yep. ruined. Yep. Now, we also say that you got 400 to 570 degrees Fahrenheit. What was the top number that you came up? 550. I didn't even hit the top number. At 200 degrees, we started to see a lot of deforming of the panel that it was completely useless. This is why you don't use uh, axiacetylene, you use something like this. Um, they do make a couple of different type tips for this that you can buy, it's a little kit that has different sizes to it. But this is the importance of understanding how to play around with it. If you notice when I first started. Just so you know, that was Celsius, not Fahrenheit, so oh. you have to go up a little bit more. I'll go up, yeah. okay. <laughs> um, what happened with uh, the first few seconds of heating, you saw the aluminum move very rapidly and very quickly, which we'll show on a panel I'm not going to try and ruin. But it'll give you an idea of what gets involved with uh, working with aluminum and, and the differences of it. Now, you never use heat to repair steel, either a heat gun, heat lamp. Uh, uh, Granger actually sells a, uh, a kit that we have for the Audi Benz program that actually has little changing resistors that actually change the temperature ranges on it. It's a pretty cool little kit. You can use the heat gun in some cases, which is a lot better than maybe sometimes using a torch. So you so want to be careful. Why was it, did it look like there was still aluminum there? And I just touched the hammer on there. And basically it's just got, it's like a paper now. Yeah, it's very thinned out. It's so just, so it's just, why is that? Uh, it's the alloying agents yeah. in it. That's why you also saw a little discoloration of red. If I had pure aluminum, with no coatings or anything on it, you wouldn't have seen that right at all. That's because of the coatings that are on uh, right. the material and what gets baked into it and stuff like that. Basically, that's just ash now. That's just ash. It's garbage. It's completely useless. Mm, yeah. um, you know, I mean, you could cut out a, a beer can and probably weld it on there uh, if you want to <laughs> and uh, get away with it. So, and again, we're going to quelch a little bit here on the show just to keep things going so we're not waiting an hour or two yep. hours for a panel to clear. We don't have that long for the show. Right. Yep. Um, but, you know, on the steel, steel repairability matrix, Larry, I have temperature um, recommendations and I have number of times. I can get it to 800 degrees three times or, or whatever the repair matrix tells me. Do I have limitations on number of times with aluminum? No, aluminum, the, the times are not cumulative or meaning that they get added together for a, a total time. With aluminum, you can, you can heat it numerous times as long as you keep in the right range. And I'll be honest with you, I think this 400 degrees Fahrenheit needs to be lowered. I think it, it should be uh, 150 to probably 300 degrees. Because um, not many outer panels are very, very thick. Uh, one millimeter, 1.2 millimeters maximum. Um, you're going to need to heat it, let it cool off. But naturally, if you try and quick cool it, and we'll show that in a few minutes here, what the, what the micro cracking could possibly look like on the aluminum, but we'll see this, the visual cracking on the, on the paint material. And if you could visually see it, what can you, what can you see, see that would have to be done microscopically, or even if I sanded the air and I actually used the uh, magnafluxing uh, uh, die kit, which right. is what every shop should have for structural damage analysis. Right, and it's not really, um not really feasible for I think us to to test micro fracture with die penetrant on everything we repair, so we've got to. It's more for it's more for your welding is right. what, what it's required for, and it's also like for example Porsche has uh, on the Panamera the 970 car, um, the front rails are extruded aluminum with a cast piece on there. We found that cast the cast piece if not checked properly can cause micro cracking and a subsequent collision event in the front will actually cause it to break. So we're told we have to check that out with some die penetrant mm -hmm. to make sure the welds haven't broke from either the cast part, the weld broke in the yeah. middle, or it broke off the uh, extruded piece. So we got to yep. sand it and just spray it. Yeah. So those are all things to consider in the repairability, which may, if I can't repair that panel without really worrying about those micro fractures and some other things, well, I'm going to replacement. Not fix it. Yeah. yeah right. At that point, I'm a parts changer, right, Larry? Parts <laughs> 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 changer. So let's let's just go. Let's get to the panel uh, yeah. that we brought. And yeah. one of the things we'll start with is is you actually created some of those fractures yesterday ahead of time, yes. so we can yeah. show people what they look like. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
So since we're going to talk about the fractured areas first, we have um, a couple of spots right here that we wound up um, heating up. Now, I caused the same dent. Basically, what I did was is I... Um, no. Hand me the bull peen hammer for a second. Make way the... for the cripple. <laughs> yeah, you want me to fix your... I mean, if you can fix my <laughs> ankle, that'd be fantastic. fantastic. Yeah, give me your ham. We're going to smash your hand. Your, your ankle won't bother you anymore. It won't hurt no, anymore. I'm going to make you symmetrical. Let's take the other side. <laughs> so if... Uh, when you hit down on this, obviously it's not a paintless dent repair because we actually scratched it. So by hitting these three spots, which I made the similar ones on the opposite side, <laughs> we heated this up and Mark was testing it. Now, uh, most of this dent actually came out. This was the same size dent. This is still a little bit there, and obviously I didn't touch that one. And you can see that the paint actually cracked. Um, and that's because I took regular uh, uh, water uh, room temperature water and poured it on top of there and actually caused some of the uh, micro cracking to occur on the aluminum that we can't see but you can actually see the paint if the paint's cracked like that and this is a factory paint job there's a major 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 issue going on here mm -hmm. so you want to be careful of that uh, using heat well done pins can be barbaric in many cases and and really since we're talking about repair and stuff like that there's a few <coughs> excuse me there's a few things we should take into consideration how do you repair panels normally normally how you repair panels is you always want access to the backside yeah. and not everything can we get access well, nowadays so what, as we what see. about this hood here then the well we have a problem with the hood well, we have an we outer and inner panel first. And, uh, oh that's taped on there okay yeah. good we're gonna, Kristen, we're just gonna put this in front of you for a second <laughs> the okay. show suddenly uh, got we improved. have an outer panel and <laughs> inner panel and uh the problem with this is we don't have access to certain areas actually where i have something welded on since we're underneath here we look in here with a bore scope it's open we can see behind there there's no adhesives there's no sound deadening material sound dampening material and there's also uh access to get back in there to spray corrosion protection properties yep. um on this side in these areas you probably have a lot of repairability Open this down. area this yep. area the problem here is that you have foam or adhesive in these right areas these edges that are holding the energy and the that'll outer. create obviously a fire but as any any technician knows has been in the business for a year or two, any hood that gets damaged, you even attempt to fix it, now all of a sudden, if this separates, you're never getting it back together again. Right. And that can be the problem. Right. So let's say we've, uh, we've looked at our panels, we've addressed all the access issues, overlap, clinches, all the things, um, and now we're, we're gonna make a repair. Yep. Is there some considerations in my shop that I need to think about of where I'm going to perform these repairs, even just a, a hood panel or a fender? Yeah, well, so, one of the things about aluminum, and aluminum and steel can't mix. So if I'm and sanding... Copper. You can't have copper mixing in. Can't have copper mixing in. Any type of substrate, you don't yeah, want to mix so them. So we don't want to mix them together because it causes galvanic corrosion, different property. So when we're sanding this, the dust is obviously going up in the air if we're in a normal circumstance. Like it's hot here, we got fans all over the place trying to keep it cool. Well, and then the one thing about the paint shop is, is that there's a, normally a prep station that's drawing basically all the air from the entire shop over to the paint department. So now, if I'm sanding this, we're gonna get aluminum particles in the air. Some of them can stay in the air up to six to possibly even eight hours. And we got a fan that's blowing it around. So the aluminum particles from this spot here could wind up obviously over in the paint department. Now, if we get- And the paint oh, department, but I mean the paint booth is actually basically a big huge vacuum absolutely. in a way. <laughs> even with the filters, it's still a big huge vacuum. <laughs> so bottom line is, is that we're gonna wind up having these particles actually potentially landing on top of steel starting galvanic corrosion actually in our paint department. So we need to actually isolate our repairs, even for a repair like this. Now, many people think that we need a clean room, we need a curtained area for like major structural repairs and that yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, I only need that if I'm gonna be like no. a certified aluminum shop You need that when you're fixing a, a door ding yeah. on an aluminum panel. You need a little small spot, you know, yep. even if you're just gonna fix small stuff. An old spray booth, if you've upgraded your spray booth and you have the old ones sitting around, your shop's big enough, yep. make that make that your aluminum repair bay if it's not required by, you know, a curtained off area or something by some sort of uh, certified collision repair uh, uh, facility program, CCRF. Yep. Yeah. And, and you're gonna need some sort of air extraction and an explosion proof fan. Yep. All right, uh, we, we have explosion proof fans here. So this is not a here. box fan from Walmart? No. Okay. We have explosion fans that was here. My explosion proof <laughs> fans here. Um, we do have the vacuum sander and the extractor. Yep. We can't run it, it's way too loud for here yep. to actually show it, but we yep. have it sitting there. And yet, uh, once again, with those things, guys, you gotta make sure you do check your water levels and your filters because it will get dirty. It does become, you know, like it's basically a fish tank right. in a way. Right. You know, kind of like the resistance welders we've talked about. 
So, I mean, we have to have a clean room, a clean area, a quarantined off area. Even if I'm fixing a dent on a steel quarter or an aluminum door panel, yep. I'm gonna have to take that door off to fix it someplace else, yep. uh, um, you know, inside the shop. Uh, and yeah, uh, you gotta take the doors off anyway to paint the whole side, but, so, I mean, you got these issues here you gotta take into consideration. And as far as cost factors, I know you asked yesterday about this, if it cost you $250,000 to open up your steel shop, it's gonna cost you kind of close to the same for aluminum yep. because guess what you have two shops have two, two shops, different yeah. shops right. and now you yep. add in probably another hundred and fifty thousand because if you get involved in carbon fiber repair so now you got three different shops working together so this is the department you're actually going to have and different type technicians that you're going to have so if i have a ford ranger and i got a two-hour dent in the hood and then i got a two-hour dent in the fender i'm not going to fix those side by side no so now these hammers are just steel hammers. Can I yes. use these on the aluminum hood and then go over and use it on the metal fender? No. Just like I can't use this roll lock disc. This, uh, um, you know, it, it'll actually just remove paint material, not, not uh, uh, the substrate. But I can't use this on aluminum and then go use it on steel. I can't use this uh, uh, small little uh, 100 grit uh, uh, roll lock grinding discs uh, on aluminum and then go use it on steel. Uh, uh, what happens is is that the material gets embedded in here and you can transfer that type energy. You shouldn't even use the same sanders because if you look at any type of sander that you have, They're it's got cold. a ton of dust jammed into it all over the place so you don't want to have that either. Um, so what we're saying is we need actually a separate set of hammers, of everything. a separate That's set what makes of it expensive. Yeah. yeah. We need a separate set of stuff for aluminum. And if you're gonna buy all that, you might as well buy, a, 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 a once again, just a, a, a standard set of, uh, uh, of material for, excuse me, a standard set of uh, metric tools just to take things apart in that area. Yep. You know, yes, you can use the same screwdrivers and the same, but you're gonna roll your big, huge toolbox all the way into the aluminum bay. So you wanna buy a whole tool kit that actually has everything encompassing right. there so that you can take care of it. Same thing with files and stuff like that. And you're really gonna need that type material. Another thing that shops don't realize is you don't, may not have to do it for undetectable repairs, but buy yourself a kit of paintless dent repair tools. The reason you want to buy paintless dent repair tools is because that's the first line of attack once you analyze your damage. You look at this, you go, I got access to the backside, let's try and remove it with paintless dent repair. On top of that, you can say, all right, I'll try this, but I understand it's got to be yeah. repaired and painted. It still might need a little bit of filler, but you're going to use paint, it's the least amount of damage. The next step after that, if you can't get back there with a paintless dent repair technique, or there might be some sort of foam in the area, yeah. or you can use glue on tab removers. I mean, yeah. our guy couldn't make it because of the weather across the United States, but- Well, you got stuck in New York for what, Yes, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I found out that that entertained a lot of people on Facebook. Well, and, let me, and let me just address that real quick. There was a shop, and I'm from Seattle. There was a shop in Seattle, and this happened during the winter time, that they were actually doing, they were just welding tabs on a steel fender, on a steel quarter panel, on an Explorer. And they welded the tabs on, and it caught the foam inside the panel on fire. Nobody knew there was foam back there. And the reason, and the way that they noticed that there was fire. It was smoking. The whole interior was built full of smoke. And they're right. like, what's going on? <laughs> and they hadn't r and the uh, interior trim panel. Which is so all now they, they realize there's a fire inside the panel. They open up the, they pull the interior trim off as quickly as they oh, can. Oh, gave it oxygen. Yeah. And then boom, now there's more oxygen. <laughs> yes. And then flamed up. They dumped like three or four fire extinguishers in there to turn it off. The problem was it didn't get to the fire. And then on top of that, it was so hot that as soon as it smothered the fire, it started back up. It heated up again. So the next thing you need is water just to cool it off. They went outside and they had a hose, which was frozen, <laughs> and the shop actually burned to the ground. It's, uh, so it's we would want to know if there's foam behind anything we're going to be doing, <laughs> which you know kind of goes back to the, we need to know everything there is about that car when we're writing the estimate right now. Right. When so every car, every time. Down. Right, yeah, you, gotta, you gotta get interior yeah. trim panels out. I, I know yeah. I, I've talked about this before, but a steel car, like the, the Honda Pilot, has a big foam gauze type pad in the quarter panels. Yep. And it's an area that you can reach. So why wouldn't you try using painless dent repair techniques, glue on dent removal, or even hammer right. off dolly type techniques just to remove that, then you have access to it. Yep. But no, people right away, glasses in, interiors in, um, you know, trim panels in, they start welding pins on there. I bought a really cool stud gun, Yes, Mary. right, a really cool stud gun. <laughs> $30 oh, oh, my favorite free. is they take a mag welder and they mag weld on yep. tabs. strip tabs, which oh. basically now the panel's ruined. Yep. And you really cause a lot of heat. So you, you really have to take a look at the backside of the panel, see what's there. And if you can use painless dent repair techniques, great. 
Next, try your glue on tab removers. Yep. Great. Right. Uh, um, we have an alternative for that if your machine breaks. Or can, I, can I hammer and dolly? I mean, ha I'm, I'm, my hammer and dolly all, you can. Yeah. The problem with hammer and dolly is, and this goes back to like uh, all the classes I've ever taken off of Rod Covell about metal shaping or some of the stuff I watched from Jesse James. Um, if you do hammer on, you're stretching and thinning out the metal. That's the uh, first, first couple of month uh, uh, body technician's biggest yeah. mistake that maybe the, the, the school trainer didn't, didn't train them the right way or he just didn't pay attention or they didn't even realize to bring it up. So you hammer on where you got the dolly and you're hitting the metal on top of the exactly. dolly. Exactly. What yeah. happens is you're thinning the metal out. Yeah. What you want to do is you want to use hammer off, which even on steel, hitting it next to where it. you push up on the damage with your dolly and you hit around or bump around the outside with uh, the hammer to try and get the panel flatter or smoother or reshape mm -hmm. it back and into that's also stress again. relieving it at the same time. Yes, yeah. stress relieving it and once again it's easier to hit lighter to hit harder than it is to hit harder and then <laughs> yeah. I already hit it too hard, I already made yeah. too much of a dent. Yeah. I've had guys walk over to a big like you know one of those oil can looking type dents that you see, a uh, big huge round dent and they walk over and they take the palm of their hand the heel of their hand, yep. they go bang, and they try and pop it out. But yep. because you put pressure in one spot, what happens? You overstretch, and now yep. they got a heat shrinking. Right. Yep. You can't heat shrink aluminum. Right. It does not heat shrink. So you do it that. Melts, so but it you do that shrink. on a door that may have been repairable. Now it's not. It's now or not repairable. Yes. Yeah. It, it becomes an issue now. Just like uh, guys who work on steel GM cars and they work on a Toyota, which is a high strength steel door skin, yep. and all of a sudden uh, the the repair techniques are even different with that. Car to car. Yeah, car to yeah. car can be different. Yeah. So that's why you really got to understand your substrates. And then the last thing to, to try and remove dents is, is barbaric, but we have to, is use the weld on pins, yeah. which is still barbaric. You're welding something on there. Uh, uh, the worst case is obviously, and I still see it going on in shops, drilling holes in panels yep. and put a screw in there and yep. well, slap hammering it out. Yeah, 1980 <laughs> wants their technique back. Yes, they do. Uh, uh, listen, you walk into some shops, you feel like you went back and you're like, oh wow, this is a small, uh, Smithsonian institution and this belongs in the body shop of the 1970s. And yeah. it's a real shame. You that mean the motor knocker with the screw on, it's probably yes, not exactly. okay anymore? Yeah. <laughs> it should go if it's still in your toolbox. Yeah. Yes. I, you know, okay, well let's jump into this. Well, and I would say it's a great, so some just some great points to remember here. If I'm a shop owner, I, the aluminum room and the tools and the equipment that goes in it is probably something you're going to be investing in, not your technicians. Yeah. Not every tech in your shop is going to go buy a completely different set no. of things for just for the aluminum. Um, and we've got some work to do there, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I, I also like to say, because of some of the things you mentioned, Larry, I think every tech, every shop owner in this country ought to know what's in every toolbox in their yep. shop. So yes. even if the techs are buying their own tools, <laughs> whether it's stud guns or scanners or whatever it is, you need to know what's in their box yep. and you need to make sure there's nothing in your shop that you wouldn't have touch a car or a specific vehicle yeah. that's in there. You know, but, and, then, and then the other thing is, you know, you, you buy a set of hammers, this could be used on steel or aluminum. So if you're gonna make this only aluminum, you wanna identify it. You know, go to Home Depot, buy a can of pink spray paint or, or orange right or, or whatever, and just somehow that. identify an aluminum <laughs> hammer only because you know how it is in a shop. They're gonna grab it, I need a hammer. They just grab a hammer and go. Yeah. They throw it back to where it was, and if it touches metal, it can never be able to use their aluminum again. Yeah. Some of these kits do come with hammers, and Mark, you got a few of them over there. Yeah. And uh, the, the issue with these are, and anyone who's bought a kit, they're not weighted the right way. They feel funny to what you're used to using. And there are plastic hammers out there. The plastic hammers are really for metal shaping. I want to take a flat stock and shape it into something different. So if I'm going to take this hood panel and make it into a motorcycle tank, that's probably great. Yep. But not for usual repair. These are a little bit different. Now, the hammers that we have there, uh, these particular hammers, these are regular body hammers. And you can use them for steel or aluminum type repair. Yep. The only issue with these hammers is that um, the faces are sometimes flat or sometimes curved. These happen to be flat. You want to make sure you get a, a flat one, a curved one. This is also flat. But you can see here that I have one that's flat and one that's serrated. One's a shrinking hammer and one's a working hammer. So how much shrinking can we do on this? Uh, you don't. You okay. don't use this. This will so actually put so that much. That doesn't belong in the aluminum box. Yeah, this will yeah. put so much stress into the aluminum that it'll actually thin it out so much and ruin it. This is good on mild steel, low grade, high strength steel, but you're probably not using this a lot. Once again, this is a shaping hammer, right. okay, uh, for shaping newer panels and stuff. <coughs> Personally, I do like the, um, 
the regular uh, pick, and, uh, pick and file ones or the flat chisel type hammers such as this one. Now what you want to do is um, you're going to take one of these hammers, let's say, and you want to make sure the edges are rounded. Snap-on does sell their regular snap-on hammers, as does Eastwood sells a set of hammers that look exactly like the steel ones. The edges are a little bit more rounded. This can be more rounded, although you're very rarely going to use this or even the pick side. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of, you know, pushing hammer and dolly. I've actually used techniques where I've used paintless dent repair tools and use this to put pressure on the back side and use this to actually use hammer and dolly. And in some cases, on some panels, you might actually need two technicians. One to kind of be on the back side, inside area, trying to push out on it, even on a door shell. Yep. Uh, a lot of infinity doors are aluminum. We can get two techs and we can you know, get away with uh, actually fixing it a lot of times, but you need two techs, so you have to calculate that into your repair times when you do go ahead and do something like yep. that. Right. Well, let's get to repair. Yeah. <laughs> well, we got a couple of different options here, and uh, one of the things Mark wanted to bring up is we're going to make a dent and try and fix it in front of you, so I'm going to take this bullpen hammer again, and um, I'm going to very gently adjust um, the dent area. Is that what they call it in New York when you take a hammer to something, you gently adjust it? Yeah, you just gently People adjust it. Cars? You're trying to, trying to co <laughs> coerce it into moving a certain way or shifting a certain way or even sometimes just shutting their mouth. I yeah. mean, it, it comes in handy. So I made a dent here. So if we and look at this right here with the, you know, we can actually see, you know, it start to, um, as the lines are going across, you can actually see what we've got as far as the dent's concerned. Yeah, and you're right, Mark, that, that fans out. It's, yeah, it goes out pretty it's, good. It's, it's a, that's a, that's a yeah. pretty good size. Now, yeah. if we were to try to fix this, just like we would normally fix steel, what's going to happen, I've seen technicians do it, they kind of fix it like steel to here, and it's got a little edge, and they grind it bigger. Yeah. Next thing you know, you're chasing this all the way across because, as you're going to see, when you heat the panel up, it chain, it a little bit of sanding is going to cause the the damage to travel. A lot of movement. Yes. So you know, Larry, when you were sanding this out, how you know not to talk about time, but we're going to talk about time. When you just sit, sanded this with 80 grit, <coughs> you didn't just buzz this off in like 20 seconds. No, damage assessors and and, and have to be able to relate or even watch this process and it yeah. would be boring if I did it in front of you and one day when we have a live class well, it, it, would, it would take a lot this, of time and yeah this live when we actually thing. have a live class they'll actually see it for themselves because yeah. uh, I'll do it in front of estimators for an estimating class um, what happens is is the preparation of the area has to be calculated into that after you're done is your uh, feather block and prime process but prior to this to prevent a lot of issues and I'm going to discuss that afterwards when I go over that dent uh, and that process that I did, it takes a lot of time to send that out, especially with the newer primers that are very, uh, um, that they're actually somewhat chip resistant. They're, they're flexible. Yep. Uh, you have your urethane paint and your urethane clears, and some companies are actually powder coating cars and then clear coating over the top of it with urethane. It's a very thick type of material. It's very uh, um, uh, uh, resistant to spent, sanding. You spent quite a bit of time just yes. feather and you can this. only use 80 grit to start with. I right. can't use yeah. anything coarser. So that's, a good, that's a good point for a lot of techs because I see that as a mistake. A lot of times I'm, I'm walking through the shop and the techs, the techs ran over and got 36 and 60 <laughs> and they're going to town on a panel and, and even just the sanding process yep. could be a no-no. I can warp panel. this panel with 50 grit. I yep. could literally warp the, the crap out of the panel. Yep. Um, some other panels might be a little bit harder because of their shape and feature lines, but I, I, I can get a panel to move at 50 grit yeah. a lot of times. 36 grit, forget it, I was actually growing through it almost. So why don't you take them through the steps, Larry, and Mark, well, let's just what do the we step did here. Real quick. We're going to do the same first, yeah, this, yeah, we're going to get this out of the way real quick. We're just going to heat this up. Wait, you got the torch? <laughs> yeah, the torch. what I want to show is, I want you guys to watch, watch how fast this dent right here moves. Okay, now, if we're looking at this, this is 92 degrees, so now you know how hot it is in the studio here. And now we're about 350, and it's gone. See how far up it came? It, it rises. Now you'll be shocked at how it'll flatten out. Now you can let this naturally cool, which is probably going to take about 10, 15 minutes in some yeah, cases. We're 275 degrees right now. How much? 275. 275. So, and you can see we got nowhere near that, that original 400. Now, go to start out with. a little bit to the right for me, Mark. Okay. What's your temperature out there? Uh, 195. So that, that's a lot of heat travel. Oh, so yeah. I'm, so I'm I out mean, here, yeah. I'm at 137. Still too hot for you to really and touch. And I'm sitting here at 104. Right? I could touch that. And I'm that. sitting right here at 97. Yeah. That's how hot it is in the studio. So this is kind of normal, but the heat traveled all the way to here. When I started this, it was 92. Now, this is, this is not what you're supposed to do, but I'm going to do this just to flatten it out. Now, if you watch, when I, I do this, and once again, when you're, when you're live and do it in front of somebody, you'll see that this actually, you know, the dent removes each time I do it. But now I'm back flat again. 
Now, that, I, that if I let it naturally cool off, not that I just quick cooled it, but watch, I can go ahead now. And I'm gonna heat it up again. Right away, you can heat it up again. And you can see I start from the outside in. There's sometimes you'll start this and you'll actually get the paddle to actually go downward. Stop immediately and redirect it. That's all. Because you want to redirect 20 degrees there. How much? 420. Yeah. Now, see, it depends on how fast you move, how quick you go around it. Now, once again, this rose up pretty high. And you can do this 50, 60, 3,000 times if you had to to remove it. Now, obviously, you're not going to do that because you can't use this water and you're not going to sit there and wait for it. You can see now, I got the paint to crack. Now, what's happening is the paint in that area, it's cracked. Right. Because of the quick cool. Now, is that aluminum cracked underneath that? Uh, it possibly could be. Yeah. You know, once again, you don't know unless you, you sand it down and go over. And I'm probably going to save this hood. And the next time I come down here, next uh, two months from now, I'm going to actually go ahead and probably do some testing with this and find out what's there. But more of it's been removed now. So let me ask you a question, Larry. So right in this area, and this is what we did yesterday, and we heated it up pretty good, and they're cracked and all that. So now, if I wanted to go back and heat that again, if I were to heat on top of where the paint is all cracked, you got to sand it. So I got to sand it. You got to sand it because the heat up. won't go through that that bubbled paint. No. So once I do that, I got to like it's, start. It's, yeah, you got to start it with really clean and yeah. stuff like that. Make sure you got your area cleaned up nice, and then you you can play around with it. And I'll show some examples on uh, another area over there. And listen, there's guys who say, oh, you can just fix it with heat alone. Yes, you can. Heat lamp. Uh, um, uh, practicing a lot with the with the with the map gas. Um, using a uh, uh, induction heater, mm -hmm. you know, something more controlled. If you're going to use open flame, you really got to practice a lot with it because you can burn the paint and stuff like that. So you want to watch it. You can burn the paint with an induction heater or even a heat lamp. Mm -hmm. So you have to practice taking an old hood or an old fender and trying to fix or remove some dents that you put in there or even some dents that are actually on there uh, can actually assist you in learning your new technique on how to take care so of now, this. So now, somebody watching this right now is going to say, you know what, I got to map gas bottle and that Ford Ranger just came in and there's a dent I I just saw Larry do it that looked pretty easy and no go, 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 <laughs> go to the junkyard then and get yourself get a, a used you know aluminum hood or something even like this one I mean this one's destroyed in the front but guess what I got plenty of other area I can practice on yeah, yeah. even if you separate the inner panel from the outer panel on a practice hood just practice you're practicing on the outer panel to get it right play with your hammer and dolly techniques primer off hammer on play with a couple of different see what works best for you you gotta practice just like I said with the welding you have to practice six hours a week for aluminum probably two hours a week for silicone bronze because you don't weld enough to get the technique down right or get, you, yeah. get your, your, your skill set better. Right. You know, and that's why you, you really got to make sure you do this. So the shop owners that are, that are looking at these big massive recycling bins in the back and as soon as a part's off a car that they're replacing, they're throwing it away. Yeah. Should they be saving some parts? Yeah, I would definitely save parts. I mean, when I do the hands-on class when I go to shops, I tell them, save me a couple of panels, not just hoods. Because hoods don't give you a realistic repair procedure besides some making doors and some fenders. Little and, small, yeah. stupid, Cut off I guess, uh, yeah. hail damage I'm yeah. making. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's so hard to create a, a repairable damage with some other tool when the panel's not on the car or bumping it into something. Right. So a fender, a door, doors are great, but the problem is not enough doors out there yet. If you're in an area that you got a lot of uh, infinities, great, you have aluminum doors. Yeah. Most of the time it's just aluminum hoods or deck lids, and that, that, right. that's uh, where that issue comes in. And okay. I just can't buy them, they're not too cheap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you're too busy buying if you're done toys. torching, yes. <laughs> or if you've done that method, Larry, where are we going to next? All right, well, let's, let's take a, a similar dent. There's a, a repair with uh, heat, and once again, we should always try paintless dent repair first, glue on tab removal, then hammer off dolly, which I'll show a hammer off dolly technique on this fender. Um, and, and, and then the, the worst case scenario is then weld pins on. Well, let's say we had the weld pins on. So we start with this number one dent here. How do I set the panel up in the area? What you want to first do is go to number two, which I put 80 there, is 80 grit sandpaper. On a DA, I'm sanding around the area, not a lot of pressure, medium speed. Um, you go around the area. Now I start to see a little bit of the breaking of the outer paint area. Now I got an idea where my dent really is because you got to find the dead center. Now I work to here. Now number three is I sanded my area a little bit more with some 80 grit to get down to my primary area. I want to leave as much paint as I can or material in the area to keep my repair area smaller. <coughs> now I take a green roll-lock disc, which will remove material, not, excuse me, paint material, not the substrate itself, or thin it out. Once again, you got to watch this. This can heat up very, very quickly. 
Now I'm gonna sand the area. I left a little black dot there, which you can't if I'm gonna weld the pin on there, but I wanted to show how far you get it down to. Now, when I'm done getting my area clean, and let's say I have this area, which is gonna be these X marks here, yep. but I wanna show what you do with the rest of the area. Now I send the rest of my area to 80 grit. Notice now I got my high and my low spots. I'm actually leveling out the area. Some guys might wanna use a flat block for this, yep. or a short sanding uh, long block, which is kinda jumbo shrimp, <laughs> little big horn. Um, so you get the, the shorter long block. Now you come over here. Let me, and just, point, let me just point something about this den. So and I, you know, we made this dent. The hammer would hit right here. Right. And you notice how when you sanded it, it's, it's dented a little more here and here than yes. it is here. And that's that travel of that dent a little further than what you can even see. So it's not just a round dent, even though, you know, it looks like, you know, the regular dent looks pretty round, but it, it, it's actually an oval right. going out that way. Now, once I, now I left this dent here. This is not supposed to be, this is supposed to be completely clean. After I welded the pin on, and I pulled it a couple of times, gave some pressure, some light hammer and dolly techniques, which I'll show with that in a minute. Um, now, I'm gonna send the rest of my area with some 80 grit, 120 grit, and feather out the area, until I finally get to number six, which is I'm combining uh, step four with step six, just to show it, you know, so you don't have to sit there and watch me do this. I have my 80 grit that I sand, oh, excuse me, my green roll lock, disc here. I did my 80 grit to go over everything, my 120 to go over everything and start a feather edging out and then my 150 around the whole area. Now I'm prepped and ready. Okay, okay but you don't have any filler or anything on no, that No, well yet. I'm supposed to be ready now for filler. If Got this it. wasn't here, this would be at the filler point. So, so you want to get it all the way down to 120, 150. Yes, I want it nice and smooth. I have less sand yeah. scratches in the area. I'm not going to take my block and go all the way around across this. I got a small little area I'm going to work with, but I have my area feathered out. So now if I want to put my polyester putty, my uh, uh, glazing putty, whatever can go over on top of scuffed uh, refinished material, mm -hmm. or leave an area that I can now feather out my, or p put in my epoxy primer, my high build color primer, to actually fill out that area and smooth it out. Well, this dent started out, this little dent was one of the exactly, same size, yeah, right? same size. So, you know, not to go crazy with this, but if I have a little dent, which on steel, you could probably contain it pretty small. Yeah. Now we're a lot bigger, because it's aluminum. It's aluminum. That might even affect how we would possibly blend into the adjacent panel yes, then. Yes, exactly. You know, so normally it would be, okay, we've got 18 inches or whatever, you know, whatever, whatever is possible. But in aluminum, it's going to become bigger, so we in may not cases. even be able to keep it, it in the panel. You know, once again, aluminum can be, it can be a large area, it can be a smaller area, yeah. it can be a couple of different things. It depends on the, uh, the, the curvature of the panel, the shape of the panel, the area you have access to. That's why it's always, well, I put five hours on this. Okay, well, it only took me an hour. Or I put three hours on it. Okay, yeah, we agree to that. And now all of a sudden it took me seven hours. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it, it really depends on which way you're looking at it. And if I'm going to squeeze by yep. you real quick, um, <coughs> when you weld the pin on, and I'm going to show the process of welding the pin on afterwards, and um, when I do these three dents over here, but you weld the pin on, you roll, uh, and let it cool because those little pins do get hot, and you're going to screw on one of these uh, eyelids, which most of these dent removal things are basically the same. I like to leave these feet a little loose. I don't tighten them so that they have a little bit of movement here. These are loose down here so they grab on. You put your hook on here and then you give a little bit of tightening. And actually sometimes you can just remove the dent that way. To give a little extra push or a little pull to it, you hit this way. Now, when you go to weld the pin on, you really need to practice because if it's too low, you wind up such as this situation here. The pins pull right off and do nothing, all right? You can also set it too high and blow a hole in it. So you want to have a piece of scrap aluminum, like I said before, that you're going to practice on, but also that you practice your weld settings on. You don't have to practice your glue on tabs because they just glue on. Once again, keep in mind though, for PDR work, glue on tabs are only guaranteed over factory finish. Yep. It'll probably work on your finish, but if you have body filler underneath that, body filler is not an adhesive, so it'll actually pull that whole spot out. So you got to be careful of that if it's a thin coat even. Um, and I'm going to explain how we're going to hook this machine up. But let's say we welded it on and stuff. I'm going to grab this here. And now what you're going to do is you're going to take your hammer. And I mean, literally, you're just going to give it some light tapping here. You're not looking to do a lot with this. Now, once you have that, then you're going to, you know, and I like to use a cloth or something between my hand. Uh, I usually, you know, funny enough, I buy white waiter's gloves the white cotton waiters gloves, and I use those because there's grease in my hand. This is sanded, cleaned aluminum that we also hit with a stainless steel wire brush 
required to putting this on to remove any type of filiform corrosion that forms instantaneously on aluminum, makes it harder to weld, harder to repair. So now, I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna feel around it and say to myself, hey, that's not too bad. I can relieve a little bit of stress on this, and I can actually move this around to a different position here, give it a little bit of tightness here. Now I have a different angle to grab these on. And then once you're done and you're happy with what the way it feels and stuff, you're going to take this off. Keep in mind that if you, you th these here sometimes get stuck. There's little pieces of metal on there, so be careful of your hands. You want to watch that. Now, how do I get these off? Well, a lot of times you guys would take a pair of pliers and just twist. Yep. If you try, try that with this, you're yep. actually going to pull a hole in one of these panels because <coughs> um, the picture that we have up there is a, it shows a little, oops, shows a little nipple that's down on this uh, bottom piece. This digs into the metal, and this can cause a problem later on. If you go to twist it off like you do with the copper pins for steel, you'll make a hole. So you want to watch out for that. What you'll do is you'll take this here, and you're going to clip off as close as you can to the bottom. Now, what you're going to do next is you're going to take a, uh, a grinding uh, disc uh, with, with 50 or 80 grit on it, but you got to be careful not to hit the aluminum. Yeah. And what you're going to do here real quick, I'm not going to do the whole thing, I'm just going to show, show it. You want to keep on, hope everyone can hear me with this on. You want to keep just on top of this, and if you're going to zero in, you'll see here. Just keep right on top. This actually becomes part of the repair. That stays there. Now, there are systems out there that sell you a, um, a file. You could file over the top of it. But Mark, if you feel that over that right now, yeah. you can feel I probably need one pin right here, yeah. but the rest of the area has all smoothed out. If you want, you can feel it, doesn't matter when I'm really repairing yeah. it. You want to run your hand over it. Because I, had, I could have pizza. Yes, yeah, you have pizza. Rub the lunch. pizza right in there, don't yeah. worry about it. Yeah. But yeah. you can see, see I need yeah. one right there. Yeah. So I weld another pin on there. Yeah. Also, guys, if you weld a pin on it, it pulls off. Don't put it in the same spot without super cleaning it really, really good. Otherwise, you're going to have an issue with it. So if we're going to take our pins and we're going to do this, they have a working clamp that has to grab on. So we have an area here that's ground down that we can grab onto. Unfortunately, with, these, with this particular one, you have to uh, sand the area in a different area than where you're working. Some have a, one built into it, which means you're going to make the area bigger. As you can see here, I didn't sand a lot of stuff off. These pins get set into this little tip here, and it's not much of an effort that you got to do. You do put a little bit of effort of squeezing down. I practiced with this before, and I found for this particular car, this particular area, the setting's at 140. So I'm going to grab this. You're just going to put a flat down on here, and you just, you're going to squeeze. And it makes a sound, and it welds on, OK? I'm gonna take another one. Hey, you know what? Now, if I uh, if I gr if I brush that, and then one of my buddies in the stall next to me, or he sticks his head in my in my curtain room and says, "Hey, let's go to lunch." When I come back, can I just get going, or do I need to kind no, of? No, you gotta clean it again. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you. If I if, let's say I was gonna do body work to this now, so let's say here I finish welding it on. I'm done banging it around. I weld my second pin on. I pull out the damage, and now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna um, I'm gonna put in the. Um, I want to put body filler. So now I got to walk over, I got to get my body filler set up, I got to pick the can up, I got to pull out the filler, I got to mix some hardener in there, I got to mix it on the board. I walk over here, right before I put it on, give a little vacuum, and I'll put it on. Because that filler form corrosion will form almost instantaneously on anything. So you want to, you want to be careful of that. Hey, Kristen, why don't you try the last one? <laughs> you want me to walk over there? Yeah, come on, you can walk over. Come on, hop along. Where's my scooter? Where's my scooter? <laughs> I had enough of that scooter. Pick it up, pull it down, put I'm, it over here, put it over there. I am going to motorize that scooter. <laughs> what's going to happen here. All right, so. Wait, 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 what are you doing here? You just did it. What do you mean? Oh, I got to keep do doing this again. over and over? Right yeah, got to keep time. doing it I can't time. just like go to the bathroom or no. read a magazine. Or what if I took a text? Or what if I got on Facebook? Okay, well, once again, here, well, first off, you want to be smiling. Here, smile from Facebook. Um, all right, yeah, try, try putting that on there. Just but it's important to make sure it, that we understand. Make sure you're in the center of it and squeeze the trigger. We're in? Oh, hang on. 
the ground, bro. See, if you hit that, you move the catch right now. Huh, you did this in person, in purpose, didn't you? Aw, oh, come on. Yes, you think sir. I'm gonna do that purposely for you? Oh. Time. Always gotta have a man do it. Oh! Ooh. You went there. Oh, you didn't oh. just say that, did you? Okay, so, so. Uh, this is where we talk about how we're looking for a new co-host. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Applications now, and demo reels could be turned into CollisionHub.com. Now, if um, everyone watched, you notice when I went to do this, I didn't send this one right away purposely. Yep. Look what happened. Yep. Just came, came right, right off. off. Just hitting it like this. And so, that's really the point we want to drive home, Larry, is I think even sometimes when a shop gets the right equipment, we don't use it thoroughly and properly, and then we have failure because of that. So right before the show started, we sanded those areas, we went ahead and we did what we had to do, and I even sanded those areas. Now it's film full, film, uh, full of foam corrosion. I purposely welded it on without cleaning it, if you notice, and now I just knocked it off with this because it wasn't set right. Although, those settings the same that I welded here. Yep. Right. So what was the difference? This I cleaned super good. Not clean This there. I didn't clean, yep. these I cleaned. So these are on there. Good. Strong. Yeah. So now, what if I wanted to have an area that I wanted to think about glue, but maybe I don't have a glue pulling machine or, a, or the glue need tap. To, you need to buy one. Well, we know that. And but uh, if worst case scenario, is there an option for me, Mark? Yeah, We've seen well, this on, on, once again, on Facebook and other places like that, so we wanted to put it to the test. Yeah. And I know years ago, before we had aluminum debt removal equipment, um, when we tried to fix uh, Audi quarter panels and doors when they first came out, we didn't want to drill holes and then take the aluminum rod and try and melt it in there with the <laughs> propane torch. That it was ridiculous. Yeah. So we tried to come up with something ingenious. A body man figured a way around it. Well, what happens if I glue the pin on there, the steel pins, the copper pins, yeah. with some you know, bonding adhesive? So that's what we've seen tried, and we actually tried it out. It's not a bad way of doing it. It's very, very expensive. Um, yeah, but, but most, if you have some most tubes, shops have a over. tube that's kind of got a little bit left yeah. in it. You know, I mean, you know I mean, we're gonna grab a hold of this, we're gonna level the plungers. You notice on this, I leveled the plungers with this, and that's how much came out before the other one, so that's, that, that would be an improper mix. Then we lay out one length of a bead of this, and then we get a little pile of it, and then we take that and put a pin on it, and we put it on this. Right. Now, for the sake of time, we're not gonna go through all that. Right. But this works, but not the probably the cheapest alternative not the not the cheapest alternative can really drive you up a wall and stuff like that and i'll tell you this much guys so you could save on your pins and stuff that you use when you weld these pins on and they either fall off because you didn't weld them properly um or you pulled with them and now that you pulled with them sometimes they'll actually pull off and because i know this one camera over here actually gets the close-up for you guys um you can see the pin that's still on there, the little nipple or the, the, the little out little piece that comes on there. And you can see the other one's got some burns to it. If you grind this one down and sand it down, yeah. make it clean, yeah. you're not going to re-weld it on again. It doesn't work again. But what I can do is I can dip it into my adhesive if it's wet. I dip it in my adhesive and I bring it over and I stick it in here. And I put a little more adhesive around the end there. Yeah. And now once it dries and I'm all done with it, I can go ahead and I can take one of my tabs these eye, uh, these eyes, the eye hooks, and I can screw this on here. And then it's just the same method using the thing. And it's now just I can, I mean, I can go ahead and I can try picking that up with the tool and let's see if this, I'm hoping it's dry enough. We put it on early this morning. I don't know with the humidity and all the other stuff going on, it might <clears> just pull off, but once they do dry, they do work pretty well. I remember years ago, Jerry Goodson, who used to be with iCar and myself tried this when I was at the, the, at the um, tech center. And it was pretty interesting to see an alternative when we didn't have weld on aluminum debt removal stuff and they didn't have glue on debt removal. Back then it was just basically drill holes and weld them back up or change the panel. And I mean, look, that's, that actually pulled <laughs> that off. Didn't hold <laughs> that didn't no, That might be a bigger tab. And we a different one there. These are sometimes different sizes, guys. And uh, you gotta make sure you get the right size. Oh, that was just a heck of a glue job, Mark. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, this one's better. This one's a little bit tighter. So you, you get it on there, and never tighten it, tighten it all the way down. You want to leave it a little loose so when you get on here with your tool. Now, once again, guys, this is really not cost effective, but you got some tubes with stuff left over, a whole bunch of extra tips. It, it's an alternative because your tool's broken or you don't have a dent removal tool yet, you know, for, for aluminum. Um, it, it's just an alternative you guys can play with a little bit. And uh, 
If I tighten this a little bit, if you can see the panel move. I mean, look at the panel yeah. move. Okay, yeah. look at how much it moved before it actually pulled it off. And yeah. once again, this is probably not 100%, it's still sticky. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if you let it fully cure, which will probably take like three, four hours, five hours, um, and our, we're very humid here today, so it's causing some issues with this, you can pull it out, all right? Um, you can work with it. So there's a couple of different options for you, and we just wanted to go up, it's practice. Mm -hmm. The guy yeah. comes in with the tool equipment, he's going to give you a little, little dog and pony show and stuff like that, and then it's a matter of your job to actually practice with things and make sure they're right. Yep. So let's just wrap it up. So we've gone a, we've gone a little bit over our time today. Yep. I know people, yep. some people <laughs> got to get to lunch, some people yes. are ready to get back to work. Yep. Um, but just a few conclusions for aluminum. So Mark, you work with a lot of shops, yep. um, coaching, mentoring, those yep. kind of things. Yep. What are some of your big takeaways that you leave with the shops when it comes to aluminum repair? Well, it's not steel. It's going to take practice. It's going to take tools it's going to take training, you know, and just, you know, it's just one of those things. The first time you fixed a dent in steel, it didn't go so well. The first time you fix a dent with aluminum, it's not going to go so well. And then obviously finding out what's behind, you know, trying to see what it is on every car, some tear down, you know, full disassembly and all that to actually see if, if it is repairable. And then an area that is going to be clean so you can actually isolate your repairs. All right. Larry, you fix a lot of aluminum cars with what you're doing and, um, up at New York. What are, what are some of your big takeaways for the shops on aluminum? Um, listen, I mean, sometimes you have a panel that you can fix. Everybody, you know, hates to see a job leave their shop or not, uh, not be able to work on it, but sometimes it's above your pay grade and uh, your, your ability to understand. Yeah. Uh, BMW, for example, with the quarter panels, they have to be uh, rivet bonded and you have a bonded sleeve that you need a, a special heat lamp or heat blankets from BMW yep. to actually make it work. If not, you get a sink line and everything like that. So it's about reading instructions, steel, aluminum, carbon fiber, I don't care what it is. Um, reading instructions, uh, uh, knowing the repair process, and then practicing. Yep. I mean, yep. look, there's a technique to use this gun that you've used for years to lay a bead out, and then there's a completely different technique for the same type of material, the same exact material used with a pneumatic gun. Yep. Completely different technique. So once again, it's just you just can't grab something and put it out. Pneumatic gun, you're going to put out way too much material. You're like, oh my god, what did I do here? Not so bad when you're bonding a panel. Try that with urethane for glass. Now I put too much material. Where does all this material go? It squeezes out someplace, yep. and you know when it squeezes out, it's a mess. Yep. So this is why it's very important to practice on new techniques. They might be similar, but they're very, very different. Right, practice, practice, practice. So for the shop owners out there, you need to be thinking about your equipment and tooling what that means to you as the owner, not to the technicians, having the clean room, and making sure that your technicians are practicing. We have talked about it earlier in the year about practicing when it comes to welding. We're going to practice when it comes to aluminum repair as well. Remember, we never practice on a customer's car <laughs> or on a repair that's actually part of a customer's yeah. repair order. Um, so we're going to be doing that on the, on the off time. All right, next month, we got a couple of uh, things that are going to be coming to you from July. So we do have the July regular Repair University show. And then we will also be live at NACE throughout the, um, throughout the week yep. um, on the iCar stage. Jason Barton will be back with us next month. Yes. Um, and we'll be talking about a few myths. Um, we're also going to have a little show. ICAR says. Yeah, what does ICAR say? So <laughs> we have a, say? A, lot of, solve uh, once for all. a lot of stuff gets posted. Yeah. ICAR says I can do this and ICAR says I can do that. So for once and all, ICAR is going to get on stage and say, say what they can and can't say right. or what, what they do. What their position is, their procedures that don't exist. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> we appreciate you hanging with us today, especially for the time that we went over. And we'll see you next month on Repair University Live.